Hi guys. Hi guys. Welcome to this week's video. It's about our passage when we cross the Indian Ocean. Now I'd like to apologize straight up. The footage is not great. It is great. It's just not spectacular, but it's great. Uh, we weren't focused on doing YouTube videos back then, so it's only uh, footage from our camera phones or a little bit on the GoPro. But we had a lot of lessons that we learned crossing that ocean and I um, think it's about valuable to other people so please have a watch. Afterwards we're going to talk uh, one of my tech tips and we're going to talk about autopilots Pilots. because ours broke yeah. in the Indian Ocean. So what we've done is compiled the footage together in a nice way we hope mm -hmm. and we're going to watch it along with you on the PC and uh, describe some things when we need to. So if you like this video, give us a thumbs up and don't forget to like and subscribe. Yeah, let's watch this. We got dolphins. After provisioning and final checkout of Sumatra, Indonesia, we were headed across the Indian Ocean. The winds were very light, so we motored the first day across to the Mentawi Islands, where we would anchor for the night, and we could set sail the next day. It's always nice to see dolphins. In fact, we hadn't seen that many around Asia. This was a great pod. This was actually Princess's first time to see dolphins in the wild. She was a little bit excited. Now we're not the superstitious kind, but just in case, this was a great omen for the beginning of our passage across the Indian Ocean. The forecast was looking great. Uh, we were using the Iridium Go and the Predict Wind package. Not cheap at all, but we didn't have the single sideband set up. We weren't going to rely on a Pacta modem and single sideband. We liked the reliability of the Iridium Go and the graphics and everything you get with it. So I'm going to do a video just on the Iridium Go and uh, the electronics for navigation uh, at some other stage, so keep a look out for that. Finally, our big day of departure. At first, I had to scrub the bottom, make sure we get every single knot that we deserve when we're sailing. It was beautiful water to get into for one final scrub of the hull just before we start our passage. And I was closely supervised by a large family of squid. And by lunchtime we were underway through the cut between the two islands, skirting around the big Indian Ocean waves, which makes Sumatra one of the most famous surfing spots in all of the world. Finally, we were sailing across the Indian Ocean. I don't know if you can hear me. We left Sumatra four hours ago. Beautiful sailing, close reach. Squeaked out of ten nuts. Correct. Going back slowly. Nice. 
So we were half a day into our passage when the brand new Raymarine Axiom 9 chart plotter failed. It was not able to find any satellites. Luckily, I still had my old Raymarine A98. Although the touchscreen didn't work, I could control it from the iPad. So we put that up temporarily next door and it has no problem finding satellites. Thankfully, that didn't set us back and we could continue. Oh, the uh, MFD failing. Just, I mean, we just left like half a day out and the brand new chart plotter failed. Can't find any satellites. Um, but luckily I hadn't sold or thrown away the old broken one. Broken, it was only the touch screen didn't work, uh, but we could manipulate it through the iPad. So that was really lucky. Um, so the problem was with the brand new improved version of this uh, chart plotter is the internal antenna is useless really. Um, the older model was sitting right next to it and could pick up 22 satellites or 24 satellites and the new one couldn't pick up any. So it, when we arrived in Mauritius we had a, a Raymarine dealer helped us to claim warranty on that and we got an external antenna uh, through warranty. So we're happy with that and it's fine now. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs>
but something had been eating it. We found these guys inside the belly. So we inspected the flesh very well and we also cooked it very well. And it was delicious. I really liked uh, nighttime watch actually. Uh, we timed it really nicely when we left Sumatra. Uh, we had moon just coming into full, so it was like uh, waxing 50%. So I was getting better and better um, for the first few days, and then it was getting less and less moonlight in the last half of the passage. So, uh, but initially it was just beautiful when the wind was calm ish and um, the sparkles on the water was mm -hmm. just lovely. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know, so therapeutic at night time. <laughs> I like it. I like it too. And at night time, the phosphorescence in the water or the bioluminescence, whatever you call it, was just beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah, it's so beautiful. Living green trails or blue, actually it was blue, wasn't it? Yeah, it was blue. It's blue, it's like glitters. Yeah, blue trails behind the hulls, you know, and just like looking down and watching the sparkles. Mm. And there was that day we could see it in the daytime as well. Yeah. They were like really big particles. We, we caught one in a bucket. And we're trying to look at what this thing is and other than describing it as a brilliant blue sparkle, <laughs> need a microscope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. We had three or four days of uh, leisurely sailing at 15 to 20 knots of wind from the uh, port quarter. It was fairly comfortable, although the Indian Ocean is uncomfortable because of a cross swell. It has the wind waves coming from the southeast and it has an ocean swell coming from the southwest. And when these two mix, it makes unpredictable peaks and troughs and side waves that slap against the boat. This makes it really hard work for the poor old autopilot who eventually failed after about the fourth or fifth day. I did have a spare belt that I could have replaced but the conditions were getting worse not better so it wouldn't last long. So from now on hand steering. Ah uh, yeah the autopilot broke uh, which is expected for the autopilot that I had. It was under spec, uh, my autopilot. Um, and the swells and the... Um, just too much work for it. Poor thing was screaming a lot, you know. Doesn't <laughs> <laughs> it? It's a noisy thing. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about that more later uh, because we've got a solution for it. Keep watching. passage was 12 days but um, which is pretty short for an Indian Ocean crossing to uh, that was to Rodriguez from uh, Sumatra to Rodriguez which is just a little shorter than Mauritius but 12 days of constant noise it's sort of Arthur he was wearing earplugs um, which is not a bad idea not a great idea because you want to hear things especially if someone's telling you to do something but um, just for fatigue to just block out the noise from time to time is um, so relaxing. Mm -hmm. When I sleep, I use earplugs, uh, but I can hear her rake whistle. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, speed control was our biggest issue with the big winds and the big waves and the surfing. Mm -hmm. um, because you go too fast and, and you end up hitting a wave that uh, has a, 
maybe you go over a crest and there's a really steep hole because of the crisscross effect of the Indian Ocean. Sometimes you get peaks like that. Instead of a, a nice rounded peak that you can sail over, you end up with peaks like that, that you just fall on into the trough. But I love the waves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you'll end up digging in and p potentially pitch poling. So you really got to keep speed under control. So um, it was a little bit late, but after that, we made a series drogue, which I'm going to do a video on. I'll show you how to make a series drogue. Haven't used it yet, but it's a, relief. Don't want to use it. <laughs> it's a relief to have one as an option, you know. But yeah, you love the waves. Clouds and all blue. Yeah, really pretty colors in the breaking crests. Uh, she was saying, oh wow, so lovely. And I'm going, Jesus Christ, <laughs> this is terrible conditions. Yeah, but it's very nice, clean, sparkly. Certainly spectacular. <laughs> I just hope I never see it again. Yeah. Conditions started to look a bit gloomy. The forecast showed from our Iridium Go predict wind forecasts that we can expect 30, 35 knots from the southeast, which is a great direction, but it's gonna make some big waves. For shift keeping or watch keeping shifts, uh, we have three on board, which is, we think is perfect. It, and we do, what was it? Three hour shifts. Three hour shifts. Depends. Yeah, daytime could stretch it because you're awake, but at night time tend to be three hour shifts. So that means you have six hours off. You do three and then you have six hours off and I think it works really well. I mean, you don't sleep all that six hours. In fact, I'm lucky if I sleep two or three, two even. I'm pretty lucky to get two in a row. Uh, but as you may have remembered on our boat tour, uh, we dropped the table down and um, Princess and I sleep here, and then I'm only two or three meters away from the helm. Even if I'm asleep, she's got a whistle, like a rape whistle, <laughs> and she can wake me up instantly. So um, that's how we do our shift keep. And when we're on shift, um, mostly we sit at the wheel. Uh, sometimes if the weather's calm, I'll, with the harness, go and sit up on the trampoline and lay down and we've got a timer we use or set your phone maybe we're listening to music although we try to avoid that too much because you may not hear a ship coming you know um, but set an alarm for every every 20 minutes and wake up because you may fall asleep and i do from time to time um, and every 20 minutes just Stick your head up and have a good look around. Make sure the wind and the conditions haven't changed. Make sure there's no traffic coming. So, it's pretty standard these days. The wind stayed, I think, 30 knots plus. Um, the most we ever saw was like low 40s. Uh, but it was for three or four days, it just stayed there. So the, the waves built up. Um, and the biggest thing with catamaran is keeping the speed under control. Um, we were, at one point we only had the storm jib up and uh, other times it was a furled headsail. And the main was just tied away, just put that thing away. Um, we were surfing, the, the fastest surf that we did was 23 knots, um, but typically it was around 17, 18 knot surfs. And in the daytime, that's okay, because you can steer the boat away from the braking areas. Um, but at nighttime, it got really scary, because there was one night, I remember one night, um, there was about three hours of complete darkness before the moon was rising. And then when it did rise, it was only half a moon. But yeah, as it was getting dark, I'm thinking, how do I see where to steer now? So what we did, we slowed the boat right down as much as we could. I think we were under 10 knots and no surfing for the next three hours. Uh, and then once the moon came up, we could see the swells, you know, well, a little bit of surfing, try keep it less than 14 knots. 
but I remember the the bang makes us smoke. Yeah, so scary. <laughs> and that's the thing. Um, this is a high bridge deck catamaran, but it still pounds or slams. You still get waves under the bridge deck. Bang! And it was not just one bang, it was like a drum roll and it was like thunder. And yeah. we were sleeping here on the bed and we would be vibrating because of the force on the bridge deck. We were like <laughs> And I'm just going, oh my God, this can't be good for the fatigue of the boat, and, you know, so. I've got a little bit of video there. When it was calmer, I could get down on the transoms with the GoPro and look under there. And it looked like normal. It, it, it looked like nothing. But no damage. No, no damage, <laughs> no problems. But it was the noise. It was sort of quite disturbing and... Uh, Scaring us. <laughs> yeah, it made the fear levels rise, you know, rise up. But I remember at night time, um, when you can't see the waves coming, you could even work out a rhythm of the waves. Mm -hmm. uh, so th when the waves are all in the same direction, mm -hmm. no problem, you can anticipate that. But with this cross swell, you would go for four, or maybe less, two or three minutes, fairly comfortably, and then all of a sudden, slap, by a wave right on the side. Um, and that was fairly regular. It's like every third or fourth minute, you could even almost count the wave sets and then there would be a slap. And you could hear it coming. It was like it had built up and it was a little bit like, I won't say freight train, but you could hear this thing coming and then you'd steer into it to try and minimize the effect of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was weird. The other thing um, I found with, I guess it's the lack of sleep, fatigue, and the emotion of it. I was, uh, I don't know whether it started in a dream, but I dreamt because the most of the wave train was behind us, mostly, almost astern on our aft quarter. It felt like we were in a river, and I, I don't know if I dreamt that, oh, it's okay, if there's a problem, there's the shore, we can just go to the shore. And I remember being awake thinking that, oh, so the, where's the land? And then I look at the charts and we're in the middle of the Indian Ocean. You know, I, my mind started playing some tricks like that. I sort of explain that away as there's such a cacophony of noise that you're joining different sounds together that sounds like words mm. and it sounds like voices in there. Uh, and then sometimes you're, I'm on the helm and then I thought you were calling me. Mm. We were in contact daily with another boat that was crossing the Indian Ocean. They were coming from Cocos Keeling to uh, Rodriguez. Our intention was Sumatra to Mauritius, but we're basically passing Rodriguez. Anyway, we on the Iridium we'd send an email every day with our position and stuff, which was quite good. Their name is uh, Cassius, and they have a video or a YouTube blog called Cassius Tales. Um, but we thought, ah, it's about 300 miles closer to go to Rodriguez. Let's just go to Rodriguez and uh, stop and have a beer with these guys, you know. So we shortened it by a day and a half, two days. Uh, and the other reason is after he had to fly back to go back to work, so uh, he was stressing a bit, so he was happy to make it a little shorter. So we're in Rodriguez for 10 days, just resting, get some more provisions, but not much, because the sail to Mauritius, just the two of us, was only two nights. And little did we know, I didn't bother going up the mast because Arthur left like the next day, as soon as we arrived at Rodriguez, Arthur left. So I didn't have anyone to winch me up the mast, which I should have done. Wow. <laughs> but when we got to Mauritius, we found that the forestay 
was a millimeter or two away from separating, which is potentially we could have lost the mast. Um, and I, this happened because of the, I guess it was corroded away, but a, a stainless steel split pin, which holds the toggle closed, must have gone. Come on. Yeah. And it may have even been because of the motion of the sea, the mast is slap, slap, slap all the time. And I guess the force day is doing this and maybe the stainless steel split pin could have even got chewed away and then disappeared. And then the, the clevis pin nearly came out. My God, we're so lucky. So I'm glad the Indian Ocean is behind us. Uh, it's supposed to be the second roughest ocean in the world. <laughs> Southern Ocean is the roughest, but the Indian can be really rough. So I'm glad it's behind us now. Mm -hmm. um, South Atlantic is next and hopefully that's nicer. Uh, so thanks for watching and uh, maybe you can get some tips out of the information and the lessons that we learned. So don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Thanks, see you next time. Oh, hang around for the tech tip coming up discussing autopilots. Bye. Hi guys, welcome to this week's tech tip. Since we had trouble in the Indian Ocean with the autopilot, that's what we're going to talk about today. First, I'll tell you about the autopilot that I had trouble with and the reasons why. It's a Raymarine Evo 100 sail wheel pilot. Here is the, uh, the drive system. There's the motor which comes through the bulkhead here with a cog that connects to a belt which runs around this race and drives the steering. Other components of the autopilot include the P70 head, uh, which is a good controller, the EV1 sensor, which is basically the gyro of the system, and the EV100 course computer. Now, the, this system is rated at 7,500 kilo boat displacement or 16,000 pound boat displacement. Um, this boat is a little heavier than that, but not much more. Rated at seven and a half ton, my boat is about eight and a half ton. So there's a good, good chance that this would work. Now, what I've found though, don't be put off by those numbers. They're just a guide put out by Ray Marine. You could have a hundred ton cruising ship, but if it was feather light to steer, why not use that sort of an autopilot? Maybe not a hundred ton. But this boat is light to steer. It's very uh, friction free in the steering. However, conditions we experienced in the Indian Ocean, um, I haven't experienced elsewhere. Just a quartering wind. So we had a uh, half quartering strong wind, 30, 35, 40 knots, but mostly it was the wave action. Now the Indian Ocean has two wave patterns, one from the southeast, one from the southwest, that crisscross and make a washing machine effect. It's really hard work on any autopilot. It was hard work on my arms when the thing failed. We could only do about two hour shifts in the rough weather because my arms and my back were just killing me from the amount of action almost half wheel locks each way to stay straight because the wave is pushing the stern of the boat across and then it swings around this way so it's constantly fishtailing really hard work for the autopilot and i don't blame it at all for breaking the belt um, what was happening the belt would i guess stretch a tiny bit there's a friction adjustment back here which you would tighten a little bit so that it would grab again and there's only a limit to that. Uh, we tighten it up two or three clicks and bang, the belt will break. Here's a belt here. So this is a replacement Raymarine belt for the uh, EV100 wheel. Um, 
very quite light you know they are light duty uh, and it is about 65 US dollars for this little piece of plastic so I did have a spare one on the Indian Ocean crossing but I didn't want to put it on because it would just break within a day or so because the conditions were getting uh, more severe so what I ended up doing I looked at the options for the next level of autopilot that I needed to buy it was another three to three and a half thousand US dollar and that's just replacing the motor and the course computer the P70 display the EV100 I could keep using that when we got to Cape Town come across a guy who had bought a heap of stock from gunboat catamarans when they went broke here in South Africa uh, and he bought all their stock of parts he was selling autopilots now this one that he had the gunboats can be a big boat 20 ton catamaran um, so he only had the type 2 rotary drive it's a raymarine rated to 20 tons my boats only eight nine maybe eight and a half nine and the course computer the ACU 400 which puts out the big current to that rotary drive uh, but his price was good enough we came to a uh, an agreement and I've placed it fitted it in Jupiter now one thing I was worried was that it would use too much battery power it says it on the specs it uses between four and a half up to sort of eight amps I think it was for uh, to drive this this motor I don't want to use that much power for the batteries um, so what I did do is I kept both autopilots I just need to plug and unplug a few the, the um, rudder reference sensor and the course computer and now I have two autopilots when it's light conditions I'll use the Evo 100 which is light on the battery power and if it gets heavy then I can use the big type 2 rotary motor but anyway let me show you come have a look here the motor is mounted the other side of this bulkhead and this is the drive cog that comes through um, had to get these cogs specially made here in South Africa fairly cheap though and then the drive train goes up to the steering so that's the steering axle just here that's my normal drive cog for my steering and that just pulls on cables that run to my tiller bar and this is the new steering cog for the autopilot and it took a little bit of fiddling around I even had to put down a bumper because the two chains would interact with each other they'd clank and tie up here so I've put this bumper to hold the steering cables out I'm not sure how that long that will last but we'll see how it goes and up in here is the new course computer the ACU 400 and all I need to do is to change computers I just have to unplug the rudder reference here Got the ACU 400 and the ACU 100. Oh, and I can turn off the power specifically to the ACU 100. Here's a lesson that I learned the hard way. The EV1 sensor, this guy here, little flying saucer guy, is uh, should be one meter away from any electricals or anything that may influence it and you know what I found the iPad which has got metal circuit boards etc I put this up here which is probably that far from the sensor and suddenly the autopilot will go Rrr! so that's in a bad position but now I'm aware of it I'll just keep that under control but yeah we can't put my iPad there up here is okay but right there no good Here's a good boat hack for you guys. Uh, Ray Marine sell autopilot bundles uh, which are missing 
the rudder reference sensor. I guess to keep their prices low, they cut out some important gear. And they'll say in the manuals that it is thoroughly recommended to have a rudder reference sensor. Uh, these to buy extra uh, are 240, 250 US dollars each. All that's inside is a potentiometer, a variable resistor. So you go to the electronic shop and buy one for a few, few dollars. Here, put one in. Uh, I, this is the steering axle that's connected to my steering wheel. So this part is 4.7K, cost three or four dollars from the electronic shop. And doesn't matter, as long as you're fairly close to that, 5K pot is okay. Doesn't matter too much how many turns, because all the ACU is looking at is the change in voltage through that pot. So the reference wire or the zero position of the rudder is the middle leg or the, the wiper of the pot. And it should be about two and a half volts. When you turn the wheel one way, the voltage goes up, maybe up to five volts. Turn the wheel the other way, the voltage goes down to close to zero volts. And if you look outside at the uh, rudder reference, it works beautifully. And that's all the information you need to give your boat, uh, to give your autopilot, for three or four dollars instead of 250. Remember, knowledge keeps you cruising.